Good afternoon, everyone. Um, hope you all are doing well. My name is Johnny Cartwright, and I'm here with the Bahamas National Trust. And we are partnering with Alive to do an environmental series. And today we will be talking about coral COVID. Good afternoon, everyone. We're just waiting for a few more people to join and we will get started soon. Uh, my name is Johnny Cartwright. I'm with the Bahamas National Trust. We've partnered with Alive for an environmental series and today we'll be discussing coral COVID. Good evening, everyone. My name is Johnny Cartwright. I'm with the Bahamas National Trust, and we've teamed up with Alive to do an environmental series. And today we'll be talking about coral COVID. We're just waiting for a few more people to join, and then we'll get started shortly.
Okay, once again, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Janisha Cartwright, and I am here from the Bahamas National Trust, and I have teamed up with Alive for an environmental series, and today we'll be discussing coral COVID. So today's agenda, we will go over introductions of myself and the Bahamas National Trust, We'll do a, do you know, um, some fun facts about coral reefs, and then we'll jump right into this ocean pandemic that is coral COVID. Um, and then lastly, we'll end on a great note with ways that you can help. So a little bit about myself. Uh, once again, my name is Janisha Cartwright. I'm an education officer at the Bahamas National Trust and I managed the Navigators program, which is an after-school program that is the high school leg of a much larger after-school program that we have called the Discovery Club. And this program is all about experiential learning um, and kids get hands-on experience within different environments and they also um, get a chance to get scuba certified. So I'm also, as part of my duties at the Bahamas National Trust, I've also been um, involved in creating videos, um, educational materials. And so I'm the creator of Ecosystems of the Bahamas, which is coming to a computer screen and TV screen near you very soon. And I'm also the co-creator of The Adventures of Zuma, which is an animated series that we just recently created last year. Um, that will be that's available online and on YouTube and hopefully on TV soon. Aside from my uh, professional duties at the Bahamas National Trust, I love scuba diving, free diving, and I'm also a professional mermaid with Bahamas Mermaids. So if you're not familiar with who the Bahamas National Trust is, we are a nonprofit membership organization and we rely very heavily on gifts and grants um, from various donors, both uh, independent and corporate. And we also get a small endowment um, from the government to conserve and protect the Bahamian uh, natural environment. So who we are by numbers, uh, we protect and manage over 2.2 million acres of protected and secured land. Uh, we educate over 20,000 lives annually through um, youth programming. We have over 90 dedicated uh, Bahamians on staff. We manage 32 national parks across the Bahamas and we have offices on eight different family islands. So who we are by our pillars, we focus heavily on national parks, which is the management of national parks um, and increase in biodiversity and enforcing the environmental legislation. We also focus very heavily on science. So that's monitoring marine and terrestrial habitats. We work uh, on citizen science and inviting Bahamian youth and the wider public to engage in citizen science projects. And we also lead and fund a lot of research um, that is used to inform national policy. And education is very near and dear to our heart. And so we offer educational programs to youth, adults, and a variety of communities across the Bahamas. Um, and we like to inform uh, science and social studies national curriculums in the Bahamas and we also foster uh, environmental stewards through experiential learning so through a variety of our programs. So here is an image of the national parks the 32 national parks that we have here in the Bahamas and you can see them in yellow on the map and where you see the uh, black dots is where we have offices, BNT offices. So before I jump right in to 
um, our little fun facts about corals. I'd just like to say that today is National Reef Day. So happy National Reef Day, everyone. And what better way to celebrate National Reef Day than to talk about our beautiful and dazzling coral reefs. Um, and coral reefs here in the Bahamas, they are our bread and butter in more ways than one. So I just wanna test your knowledge a little bit about how much you know about coral reefs. So a question, are coral reefs minerals, animals, or plants? And I know the answer is right there, um, but most people believe that corals are uh, just plants or just animals or just rocks as we've, we've heard those answers, but they are in fact all three. So corals are tiny animals called polyps and they're, re they're related to sea anemones, um, but to protect themselves, they secrete a calcium carbonate or limestone exoskeleton, which is what we visibly see as a coral reef. Um, and they also have a microscopic algae called zooxanthellae living within their tissues that conducts photosynthesis. And that is why they are also considered plants. So is a coral reef one or two organisms? Um, and the answer is it's actually hundreds of thousands of organisms in one living on a reef. So coral polyps, which are the, the animal um, aspects of a coral reef, live together in large colonies and they're very tiny. So on your bottom left of the screen, you can see um, an example of how a, a coral polyp looks up close. And then on the right hand side, you can see the much larger coral. And so they live in very large colonies, cozied up together. And so that one mound or one coral head that we see on the right side can actually be hundreds of thousands of corals. And corals also grow very slow. So that mound is probably very old. So where do corals get their colors from? They get their colors from their friendly tenants, the zooxanthellae. So the microscopic algae that lives within the tissues of the corals give them their dazzling colors. And so the algae comes in a variety of different colors. They come in different greens, yellows, pinks, of all of these different colors that we see on the reef. Um, and without these, the algae living within the tissue of the corals, they actually appear white and very dull. And this is known as coral bleaching. So can we survive without coral reefs? And the answer is absolutely not. Um, in the Bahamas and across the world, coral reefs provide us with a variety of different goods and services. But like I mentioned earlier, in the Bahamas specifically, coral reefs are our bread and butter in more ways than one. And so we rely on it heavily for food, for fun and recreation, for sand, for jobs, for education, for medicines. Um, so food, I mean, all of our Bahamian favorites uh, call the coral reefs home. So our Nassau groupers, our queen conch, our crawfish, our snappers, and our grunts, they all thrive on healthy coral reefs. And we depend on them heavily for food. We also depend very heavily on coral reefs for jobs. Uh, two of our top industries in the Bahamas, tourism and fishing, would be nothing without coral reefs. Uh, so coral reefs provide ecotourism, they provide uh, exports of a variety of different fisheries products. And so we rely on it very, very heavily. It's also a means of education. So not only experiential um, learning that we can take our kids out there and teach them, but also a means and a tool of 
uh, research so that we can learn more about climate change and more about our oceans. And in terms of medicines, some uh, organisms living within a coral reef have actually been used to produce proteins that have been known to kill cancer cells and help to treat cancer. And so coral reefs just have uh, loads of, of benefits to us, healthy and alive. Do coral reefs combat global warming? The answer is yes. Coral reefs are giant, living, breathing organisms, and they're essential to helping us manage the carbon dioxide levels in the ocean and in the atmosphere. So like mentioned before, the um, microscopic algae that lives within the tissues of the coral reefs, they produce food using photosynthesis. And so in the process of photosynthesis, they absorb carbon dioxide and they actually convert it into oxygen. So in this way, coral reefs are cleaning our oceans and they're helping us um, manage the levels of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere as well. And carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that when um, emitted into the atmosphere traps heat and causes the earth to warm, which is known as global warming. So do coral reefs protect us? The answer is yes. Coral reefs are a crucial part of our defense against storm waves, especially during hurricane seasons. So they are a self-repairing barricade between us and monstrous waves that are created during these storms. And the waves don't dissipate completely when they hit a reef, but a lot of the energy is absorbed and it breaks up the wave so that we don't get the full brunt of, of the um, storm surge when it hits our coastlines. And so in this way, coral reefs protect us from coastal erosion. Um, they protect a lot of our beaches and a lot of our coastal properties from damage. And now we jump into why we're all actually here to learn about coral COVID. Um, so coral COVID, which we're calling, you know, it's an ocean pandemic, it's alarming. The real name for it is actually stony coral tissue loss disease. And it's a new threat to coral reefs in the Bahamas and it's possibly one of the most serious threats we have to date. So before I jump right into all of the, the nitty gritty of what stony coral tissue loss disease is, um, I think it's very important to mention that this is not the only disease that our corals are faced with. Um, there's over 15 different coral diseases that have been reported in the Caribbean region. Just to name a few, black band disease, red band disease, white plague, and the list goes on. And these different diseases, they vary in mortality rates and severity. So they vary in how fast they can kill a coral. And even if they can kill a coral at all, some are not as serious as others. And they also vary in what causes them. So some are caused by viruses, some are caused by bacteria, fungus, and various algae. Um, so there's a number of, of things that can cause them. And also our corals in the Bahamas are also faced with the impacts of climate change. And so coral bleaching, which is a name given to um, the action of corals expelling their zooxanthellae and appearing white, leaves the corals more susceptible to, to diseases and it leaves them vulnerable. And so that can also be a contributing factor to um, a number of different diseases corals can catch. But on a lighter note, on average, less than 15% of the coral reefs surveyed in the Bahamas to date are diseased, although this number is subject to change once more research is conducted. 
So what exactly is stony coral tissue loss disease? And that is an absolute mouthful. Um, but it's a disease that attacks the tissues of stony reef building corals. So these are your brain corals, your star corals, your pillar corals. And I'll show you images of those in a, in a few minutes. So we know that this disease is waterborne and it may be spread through direct contact, whether it be humans um, physically touching corals, touching an infected coral and then touching a healthy coral, or whether it be us um, unconsciously rubbing against a coral with our dive gear and then um, infecting a, a healthy area or whether it's the bilge water from our boats. Um, it can be from direct contact and that is what we know at this point. Another thing that we know about this disease is that it's very similar to other disease scientists have seen in the Caribbean region. However, it differs greatly in terms of how lethal it is this disease is a lot more deadly than, all, than any other that we've seen so far. So what does it look like? So I'm going to show you um, right here. I hope you can see my mouse. Um, but to your bottom right corner is an image of a brain coral that has been infected with stony coral tissue loss disease. So you can see a white band um, that's around the greenish tint of the coral. That white band is actually dead skeleton. And so chances are that is where um, that that is where the disease started to infect the coral. Then we have the greenish tint, which is actually algae that is overgrown the either infected or dead coral area. And then we have the dark brown tissue, which is living coral tissue. And so the dark brown color that it has is from the algae that lives within its tissues and it's still alive. And then we have the lighter brown color, which is an exposed coral, that is exposed um, coral flesh that's likely infected and can die at any minute. And so normally the disease starts out as a little blotch or a little line, and then it very quickly spreads across the corals, um, killing it as, it as it moves. So where does this disease occur? So it was first sighted in the fall of 2014 off the coast of Miami. And since then it has spread um, throughout reefs in Florida, throughout a variety of different Caribbean countries, including Jamaica, Belize, the British Virgin Islands, Guadeloupe, St. Lucia, Martinique, just to name a few. And it is also spread to the Bahamas and it has infected a number of our um, Bahamian islands, including Grand Bahama, New Providence, Rose Island, Eleuthera, and San Salvador. So that's five Bahamian islands that have been infected already and it is spreading. So which coral species are vulnerable? So like we mentioned earlier, it is a stony coral um, disease. And so the reef building corals are the ones that are um, most affected to our knowledge right now, which are, for example, your brain coral, your star coral, and your pillar corals, as seen in the images. Top left is your star coral, top right is your pillar coral, and to the bottom is your brain coral. And from these images, you can see the whiteness um, where the corals are dead. And then you can see the parts where it still has color, where it's alive. And corals that are affected by climate change and global warming that become bleached are also very vulnerable to stony coral tissue loss disease as they 
become more susceptible um, and they're not protected as much. And this information is subject to change when further research is conducted. So this is just what we know right now, but it can very well affect um, different species of corals and we just don't know that yet. So what causes stony coral tissue loss disease? The exact cause is still to be determined. Um, so there is lots of research underway. Um, some work has been done. However, we, we are a bit, um, we've had to pause uh, a lot of our research as we're pending permits from the government. And so we would love to do more as this is a very lethal disease we would love to, to do a lot more research to understand it more, um, but it's, we're very limited in what we can do at this time. Why is it such a threat? It is a threat because it is highly contagious um, and it causes rapid mortality. So um, corals that are infected with uh, coral COVID uh, can lose tissue at a rate of three centimeters per day, which probably sounds like nothing <laughs> to the average person, but corals actually take a very long time to grow. They grow extremely slow. Um, so on average, corals grow maybe one to three inches a year. And so a coral that maybe took 200 plus years to grow can be dead within weeks once infected with this with this disease, um, and it's it's a huge threat because there's still so much that we don't know about it. And like mentioned many times, we depend heavily on coral reefs in the Bahamas for our survival. So, who can help fight against um, coral reefs? So fishermen, divers, snorkelers, visitors, boaters, commercial ships. Um, we can all be of assistance in the help and the fight against um, coral COVID. So it is uh, suggested um, that fishermen, divers, and snorkelers uh, get a permit to carry bleach on their boat so that they can rinse their gear off in between dives um, to to minimize the risk of infecting a healthy coral reef from an area that was um, infected previously. So it's suggested that for every one gallon of either fresh water or seawater, um, one cup of sodium percarbonate powder is added. Um, and the suggested brand for that is Earthborn Elements. And this information can be found on the website for the Perry Institute for Marine Science. And I can drop the link in the chat in a few minutes. It is also suggested that for every five gallons of water, three to four full caps um, of bleach is added so that you can rinse your masks, your snorkels, your fins, um, even your spares or your dive knives or whatever um, dive utensils and materials that you um, may use on your, on your dives. And it's also, um, fishermen are also asked to, sorry, visitors are also asked to rent local gear to minimize the risk of spreading diseases. And so if they rent from Bahamians that are very aware of what's going on in our oceans and very aware of how to properly disinfect their gear, then this can minimize the spread of this deadly disease. It's also advised that everyone, not just visitors, but everyone, when you visit a coral reef, um, that you experience the beauty of the reef with your eyes only and not your hands. Um, so we don't want to touch anything on the reef 
we don't know what's on our hands and corals are very tiny sensitive animals so not only can we pass diseases and bacteria to them on our hands but we can we can also um, crush them and harm them in other ways by physically touching the reef um, that can be very damaging so we just advise that everyone experience it with your eyes only and not with your hands and we also um, advise that boaters pump their bilge on site before they go to another site. And so this can, can also aid in minimizing the risk of, of the disease. And it, it is also useful if you, um, if you treat your bilge water. So you can treat your bilge water with sodium percarbonate and you can let it sit for 10 minutes and then you can pump that out again. Um, and that will help flush that system out so that you can move on to another site and you do not pass on those germs. And the same goes for commercial ships. Um, it's very important that they properly exchange ballast water to prevent the spread of the disease. So another way that you can help is by joining the Reef Rescue Network. So what this is, is it's for um, scuba divers that are already certified or anyone that would like to get certified. You can become a PADI Reef Rescue Diver and you can aid in the maintenance of corals and also the outplanting of corals, which is the planting of coral fragments onto reefs. And the reason this is being done is to increase biodiversity on the reefs, but also to combat a variety of different diseases. And it also helps with monitoring these diseases and um, helping us find different ways on how to treat it. So this is a course that is offered by the Reef Rescue Network through the Perry Institute for Marine Science. And so you can go on their website and find more information about that. And they have a number of different coral trees um, in Grand Bahama, in Nassau, and on a number of different islands where they're actually collecting coral fragments that break off during hurricanes and storms and they're planting them, um, letting them grow in a healthy environment where they don't have to compete um, with other organisms for space. Um, and they're monitoring them often so that they can grow healthy and at a faster rate. And lastly, how do you report stony coral tissue loss disease? There, a, there are a number of ways that you can do this. So you can snap a photo of the coral that you see that you think may be infected. Um, you can record your GPS location and the date that you visited this site. And you can submit all of that information online to perryinstitute.org forward slash SCLTD. Uh, or you can text your GPS coordinates or your images to 808-2964 or 804-9470. Or you can download the Best Protect 242 app where you can answer some questions, upload some photos, and we're able to log this information to uh, keep up to date with what's going on on our reefs. And with all of that being said, I would just like to say a huge thank you to everyone that's joined this live tonight. Um, I encourage you to stay in touch with the Bahamas National Trust. Of course, one of the biggest ways that you can help us um, with the fight is by donating or becoming a member. Um, that helps us to continue to do the work that we do and continue to protect our coral reefs. And so you can follow us on Instagram at Bahamas National Trust. You can follow us on Facebook and any information that you would like to learn about, you can find on our website at bnt.bs. 
And if anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and type it in the chat. And I will now open the floor for questions. Okay, if nobody has any questions, I would just like to say a huge thank you to everyone. Um, happy World Reef Day and have a great evening.